India abstains once again as the world marks one year of the war in Ukraine with a vote at the UN General Assembly in New York. On the ground, there's no end game in sight to the conflict. Is there still a role that India can play? Hello and welcome to Worldview at the Hindu with me, Sohasini Heather. This is episode 97 and this week counts one year since Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered attacks across Ukraine, actions that have triggered the biggest military face-off in Europe since the Second World War and have changed the global, political and economic landscape. In Moscow this week, President Putin defended his actions. In Kiev, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky was joined by US President Joseph Biden in a message of solidarity. And in New York, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution where most of the players voted exactly as they did a year ago. 141 or nearly 80% of the hall voted for the resolution to criticize Russia. India, as it has done for the past 20 or so votes over the year at the UNGA, the UN Security Council when it was a member, the IAEA, the Human Rights Council decided to abstain. First, let's just take a look at what that resolution at the UN General Assembly that has now been passed because it only needed about two thirds majority to pass actually said. It called for a comprehensive, just and lasting peace. Now, it's important that it called for peace and not talks. We'll tell you why. It deplored human rights and humanitarian consequences of aggression by Russia. These are all words inside the resolution, makes it clear why India refused to vote for it. It demanded that Russia immediately, completely and unconditionally withdraw all of its military forces and to cease hostilities. And it asked for accountability for war crimes that have been committed, indicating Russia, under the International Criminal Court. Now, there was a counter from Belarus, uh, Russia's closest ally in the conflict. It proposed two amendments to the, um, uh, to the resolution, both of which were defeated. One, it proposed to delete the reference to Russia's actions as a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Say, Russia only refers to this as a special military operation. And if it had been an invasion, it would have been over by now. Second, Belarus said the draft resolution should include an immediate call for peace negotiations, not just for calling for peace, but negotiations. The Western position, remember, is that it will not call for talks unless Ukraine itself wants talks, which it doesn't at the present. Listen in to what the German foreign minister, Annalena Baerbock, said. If Russia stops fighting, this war ends. If Ukraine stops fighting, Ukraine ends. Well, eventually, the UNGA vote 141 in favor, just seven against and 32 abstentions. Tell us all you need to know about the world one year into the Ukraine conflict. Now, why do I say this? First, you take a look at the US and its European allies. They are united. They're united not only on uh, the votes, they're also united on a number of actions. Um, they're dealing with the energy crisis by diversifying sources to the Gulf. The US is using its own sources. Uh, they are united on the support to Ukraine, which is humanitarian, economic, military, all three. Uh, and a tenth round of EU sanctions have gone into place on Russia uh, at this one year anniversary. And those countries are working together there. On the other side, there's Russia. It has a few uh, friends. It controls now about one fifth of Ukrainian territory. Uh, and Putin has ordered the training of a new batch of conscripts for an offensive this year. Uh, Russia certainly has the full support of only a handful of countries, but it's maintaining its ties with all countries, even countries that have voted against it, uh, other than the West and US allies. Uh, Russia has also uh, cut its oil supplies to the EU and EU countries themselves have said that they want to cut oil supplies from Russia. The, so oil has dropped about 80%, gas has dropped about 60%, uh, which means less revenues for Russia, but also that, the, that Europe has had to look for more expensive sources. Uh, despite that, the Russian economy has seen a contraction of only about 2.1% in the past year. Um, and we'll tell you more of why that happened. And then you look at the third party, if you like, the global south and the non-aligned world. Uh, it's certainly divided, even though there seems to be a greater understanding that there is a large part of the world that is uncomfortable both with Russia's actions as well as with the sanctions and other counteractions by the West. We see BRICS countries divided. Brazil voted for the resolution. 
Nam countries divided, Egypt and Indonesia voted for the resolution and even in India's neighborhood, uh, we've seen division. Bhutan, Maldives, Nepal voted in favor of the Western resolution. Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka all abstained along with India's position. Um, so that's one part of it. The second is when you look at India. India's position actually has not changed at all in the past year. So whatever India decided to do a year ago uh, seems to continue. At the United Nations, India continues to abstain as we've listed out for you. India's ties with Russia uh, have been maintained over the past year, some pluses, some minuses. At a political level, high level meetings have continued, except uh, perhaps Prime Minister Modi did not travel to Moscow last year for the annual summit. However, President Putin is invited to Delhi twice this year for the SCO summit and the G20 summit and the question whether he'll hold bilateral talks as well. Economic ties have shown actually a massive 400% jump, uh, particularly because of India's import in Russian oil, fertilizer and other commodities. Russia jumped from number 17 of India's suppliers to number one, accounting for 28% of oil imports compared to just 0.2% the year before. India's imports from Russia jumped 34 uh, of oil from 40,000 barrels per day to 1.27 million barrels per day. Then you look at India-Russia defense ties. They have not formally changed, but they've seen some attrition as Russia has been unable to supply India with hardware purchases on time, uh, the S-400 being a case in point. In addition, Indian payments have been held up by the US sanctions, and those are still being worked out. There's still talks going on for that. And then India and Russia have spoken a lot on Afghanistan and regional issues, continue to coordinate closely on Afghanistan. Uh, National Security Advisor Ajit Doval even met with President Putin. This is a rare sort of uh, uh, meeting of this kind during his visit to Moscow last month, in fact, this month. Um, and then with Ukraine, if you look at India's position, it has continued what it calls a people-centric approach. That means it only supplies humanitarian support. More importantly, no support on mul multilateral votes, um, except for maybe a few technical ones. Listen in to the explanation by India's permanent representative at the UN, Richard Kamboj. Today, as the General Assembly marks a year of the Ukrainian conflict, it is important that we ask ourselves a few pertinent questions. Are we anywhere near a possible solution acceptable to both sides? Can any process that does not involve either of the two sides ever lead to a credible and meaningful solution? Has the UN system, and particularly its principal organ, the UN Security Council, based on a 1945 world construct, not been rendered ineffective? to address contemporary challenges to global peace and security. So now let's just take a look at what are the possible scenarios for the next year. Given the positions of every country in the world, including India, what are the scenarios? On the ground, and you can just take a look at the graphics over there, you can see from the figures that Russia has sustained many military losses. But that compared to its size, Ukraine has lost much, much more because Russia is, of course, several times bigger. Uh, so 180,000 Russian soldiers believed to be casualties, 100,000 Ukrainian soldiers. Uh, and then that's not counting the civilian casualties. 3,000 Russian tanks down, about 1,000 Ukrainian tanks down. Of course, Ukraine's getting more of those from the West. 150 Russian aircraft and helicopters in all to about 90 Ukrainian have been lost. And about 12 Russian naval ships, Russia has done better in the maritime sphere, to 25 Ukrainian ships. What is this real picture actually mean for the war on the ground. One, it certainly means that in Ukraine will continue to need even more military aid from the West, not just rockets, tanks, aircraft, ships. Uh, it will probably mean, need launch missiles, missile systems, air defenses. Um, remember, NATO countries have all increased their def defense budgets due to the war to sustain their efforts. And they'll continue to keep uh, those efforts going in terms of the fact of holding Russia back, not allowing Russia to take or capture any more territory than it does have. What this essentially means is that the Europe and US will get more and more involved. And it's only uh, a question of when the war ends that we will actually see some kind of a pause in the support they give. Second, Russian control on its side of the Dnipro River really means that status quo is in favor at present of Moscow's position if it decides to stay there. 
um, to dislodge Russian forces will need both a massive escalation by Ukraine, also an insurgency perhaps within annexed territories. This is difficult without Western support on the ground. This does not take into account if Russia plans an offensive and loses many soldiers. That's a different scenario. Uh, Ukraine for the moment has no incentive to go to the table for talks until it gains more military advantage. So there is no appetite at present which explains uh, why they, they didn't put it into the resolution. Uh, India, of course, could play a role here as G20 president. Remember, as G20 president, Indonesian president traveled to both Kiev and Moscow. So far, we have not seen uh, Prime Minister Modi deciding to do that, but that could happen this year. The larger scenario of the global order is worth studying as well. Uh, on the one hand, what we are seeing is that US and its military allies are much, much closer, even Japan, South Korea, Australia. Russia and China, on the other hand, are also much closer, suggesting that the global standoff will only deepen and the UN's role, particularly the UN Security uh, Council's role, uh, as the Indian ambassador said, is in some peril given it is so polarized. In such a situation, India continues to be faced with what's called a Hobson's choice. Uh, to support the West and lose its important friendship with Russia on the one hand, or to support Russia even as it gets closer to India's arch rival uh, China and risk the ire of the West as well. It's a very difficult choice, perhaps easier not to make a choice. Uh, that seems to be the Indian position. I'm going to get you some reading recommendations on one year of the Ukraine war because so much has been written over the past year. If you need to just break it down, uh, here are some books. Let me warn you, this is a very long list. It's probably the longest list we've had at Worldview so far. So I'm going to spin through them very quickly. Here are the books with the Ukrainian or Western perspective, if you like. Uh, to begin with a book by Ukrainian President Zelensky himself, it's called A Message from Ukraine, selection of essays. Um, Borderland, A Journey Through the History of Ukraine by Anna Reid very worth reading. Hybrid Warriors, Proxies, Freelancers and Moscow's Struggle for Ukraine by Anna Ar Arutunian. Uh, she's a journalist from Ukraine who's now in, uh, run, uh, has had to flee the war. Russia's Road to the War with Ukraine's Invasion Amidst the Ashes of Empires. This is by Samir Puri, excellent book. Invasion, Russia's Bloody War and Ukraine's Fight for Survival by Luke Harding. I think I have recommended this in the past. As well as another book, Putin's Wars, from Chechnya to Ukraine by Mark Galeotti. Uh, and in fact, there's that interview of Mark Galeotti on the Hindus website as well. Let's take a look at the books that look a little more sympathetically, if you like, because of course, English language books tend not to take the Russian perspective. Um, but there are some that have a more sympathetic view, like The Great Delusion, Liberal Dreams and International Realities by John Mearsheimer. Uh, who's also the author of The Tragedy of Great Power Politics. Now, these have been written before the Ukrainian invasion, even so very uh, important for context. Russian World, Understanding the Ukraine Conflict by Nikolai Petrov. Also, Illiberal Europe, Eastern Europe, From the Fall of the Berlin Wall to the War in Ukraine by Leon Mark. Uh, very, very important background there. Uh, also, in the How the West Brought War to Ukraine by Benjamin Abelow. Obviously, these are not very popular sentiments in the West, but important to read. And then there is the Indian perspective, what people in India have written. Remember, when it comes to the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, Indians are all about peace. Um, it might not be the same when it comes to wars closer home, of course. Um, so there's A World Without War by Sandeep Waslekar, which is a new book. It's just out, well worth reading. Strategic Challenges, India in 2030. Jaydev Ranade has edited this work, but Ambassador P.S. Raghavan writes about the Russia relationship. India as Kingmaker, Status Quo or Revisionist Power by Akriti Tandon and Michael Slobodchikov. Uh, this is a new book, well worth reading. Uh, there's a political work that is out, and I don't often uh, come across these, but this one is written by the BJP, the ruling party's uh, own foreign policy cell head, Vijay Chotaiwali, as well as the head of the uh, Institute of Defense Strategic Analysis, Sujan Chinoy. So it's really a melding of government and politics, if you like, with a foreword by the External Affairs Minister, S.J. Shankar. It's called Modi Shaping a Global War Order in Flux. Obviously, very complimentary about India and particularly about the Modi government's actions. Very important to read for understanding the government's point of view. And then finally, this book, which I really enjoyed, it's just out in paperback called Strongman Saviors, A Political Economy of Populism in India, Turkey, Russia, and Brazil by Dipanshu Mohan. 
and Abhinav Padmanabhan. Remember, there's always the ground position and then there is the larger picture which matters to all of us. So we do hope you'll keep joining us here on Worldview for more of that picture from the team. Thanks for watching.